All right, well, boy, I'm going to I'm going to put folks on mute and let you get the call started uh, right on time. Sounds good. Okay, everybody, like Asia just said, um, we're going to put everybody on mute because it is 1 p.m. on the East Coast. And as always, we're going to go ahead and start our call on time. Um, when the time comes for questions and comments, I will tell you how to request um, unmuting so we can hear from you. Um, my name is Will Boy, and I'm one of two citizen empowerment coordinators here at American Promise. And I want to welcome you to the American Promise National Citizen Leader Call for March 2018. And this is a call that happens on the second Saturday of every month. Thanks to all of you who've taken the time out of your busy weekends to join us. Or maybe you couldn't make it live and you're listening to the recording afterwards. Either way, you're stepping up to save up our democracy. So thank you. And today we are incredibly honored to have a guest speaker with us today, U.S. Representative Rick Nolan from Minnesota's 8th District. Um, last month we gained insight into how to effectively lobby our elected officials from Pennsylvania State Rep Mary Jo Daly. And this month we'll learn about the federal legislation Representative Nolan first introduced in 2013 that has been so instrumental in our work towards ratifying the 28th Amendment. And as always, there will be time for question and answer, so please be thinking of questions, and I'll let you know how to request unmuting you so we can call from you. After hearing from Representative Nolan, we're going to hear a grassroots victory from dynamic citizen leader Ishwari Solahub of Santa Fe, New Mexico. Then we'll do a role play, practicing a way to ask a series of questions that will allow your elected official or candidate to go deeper into our issue, which, as a result, might reveal an opening on next steps with them. We'll finish by talking about this month's action, generating support for the American Promise Candidate Pledge. This is going to be an exciting call detailing the targeted action empowered Americans are taking to push us forward to the 28th Amendment to get big money out of politics. And again, thank you to everybody who is here stepping up um, to save our democracy. And if you're more interested in learning about what it takes to start an American Promise Association in your community, please send me an email at w-a-m-b-u-i-g at americanpromise.net. That's w-a-m-b-u-i-g at americanpromise.net. And I want to start by sharing this quote from Horace Mann, who was an educational reformer in the early years of our nation, who said, let us not be content, content to wait and see what will happen, but give us the determination to make the right things happen. I just want to repeat that. Let us not be content to wait and see what will happen, but give us the determination to make the right things happen. And I think everyone on this call is here today because they're not content with waiting to see if money's influence in our political system will change and are eager to work on making the right thing happen to get a 28th Amendment enacted. We, the citizens, are working together on this solution in a cross-partisan way and indeed have the determination needed to see this amendment to victory. So thank you all for choosing action over apathy. I'm now going to pass it over to Jeff Clements, American Promises founder and president. Hi, Jeff. Hey, well, boy. How are you doing? Good to hear everybody on the phone. Uh, the many thousands of American Promise members and citizen leaders across the country. Congressman Rick Nolan is with us today. Congressman Nolan, thank you so much for joining us and for all your amazing leadership in Congress for this constitutional amendment to make sure that the people govern rather than money and the big donors. Uh, Congressman Rick Nolan has been a leader for the 28th Amendment in Congress. His first congressional service was from 1975 to 1981. He was recognized nationwide for his battles on behalf of working families, farmers, small businesses, and rural communities. And in 1981, he left Congress to start his own local business and later served as president of the Minnesota Trade Center Corporation. Uh, knowing the needs of the country and the call to service that he felt, he returned to Congress in 2013 and has made common sense ethics reform his priority. He first introduced H.J. Res. 48, which would be a constitutional amendment to the U.S. Constitution, 
in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in February 2013. And this amendment would uh, put um, the states and Congress with the requirement to regulate big money in politics so that the people are represented and clarify uh, that the constitutional rights of human beings belong to human beings and not to global corporations. Uh, he has uh, made this a priority. He's worked really hard for it. He's worked with Americans in, in not only in Minnesota, but across the country. And for that, Representative Nolan, we are uh, very grateful, as we know your constituents in Minnesota are. Uh, before I turn the mic over to you, uh, let me just tell you the kind of people that you're speaking with on the phone call today. These are citizen leaders, volunteers for American Promise and organizations, local, state, and national around the country. Uh, working to make this constitutional amendment a reality. They are people like Vicki Barnes, my friend and Minnesota uh, citizen leader, uh, who organized an amazing series of events in St. Paul and Rochester that I had the honor of attending last month with the League of Women Voters, Minnesota Clean Elections, as well as American Promise, and people like Vicki in Ohio, New Jersey, and elsewhere who are taking the responsibility to meet with members of Congress, whether the Republicans, Democrats, or independents, to uh, persuade and, and talk about this constitutional amendment and build support across the aisle. So that's the kind of people who are on the call. They're ready to get to work, and they know they're excited to hear what you have to share with us. So Congressman Nolan, take it away, and thank you again. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Jeff. And uh, thank you to all the volunteers citizen leaders uh, participating well, I personally uh, have more years of uh, both uh, private and, and public sector uh, engagement than probably anybody on the call here. And I must tell you, um, reversing uh, Citizens United and combining that with other campaign reform issues, in my judgment, is probably the single most important issue uh, facing this country today. In fact, uh, in my judgment, it, it, it challenges the very foundation and the values of, of democracy itself. Uh, the simple uh, truth is, is that uh, since you Citizens United, uh, dark money has, has taken over the uh, campaign uh, political process. And uh, I like to refer to my, my many Ds that follow from it. Uh, the distortion, the discouragement, the diminishing of people's confidence in politics, the distractions, um, the denigration of the entire process, the discouraging of people from running for public, for public office, uh, all of which have had such a terribly negative effect on people's confidence uh, in government, people's willingness to even seek public office. And uh, that, unfortunately, um, and a point that gets lost has has corresponded corresponded with a, um, uh, a, a changes in, in the legislative process, um, whereby the uh, Congress of the United States has become uh, probably one of the most undemocratic. Uh, and I'm not talking about Democrats versus Republicans. I'm talking about democracy. It's probably become one of the most undemocratic institutions uh, in America. And uh, the reason um, being that um, when you have all this dark money in politics and all the partisanship and, and all the Ds that I mentioned that, that go with, with, with this whole process, um, corresponding is, is a Congress that has been the most closed Congress in the history of the country. And I, I had an opportunity to see uh, how it worked in, in the 70s and, and in the 80s. And everything came up through uh, what we call regular order, meaning uh, through the committees, where uh, if anybody had an idea or an amendment, they could offer it. And then it went to the floor of the House of Representatives or the Senate. And again, under an open rule, where if anybody had an amendment that they wanted to offer or consider, uh, they offered it, had it argued, debated, and voted on. That simply doesn't happen anymore, uh, whether you're talking about funding the government or a $658 billion defense authorization 
um, you name it. Uh, all the concern about immigration. We have not had a bill on immigration before the floor of the House. All the talk about gun safety. We have not had a bill on gun safety before the floor of the House. Uh, we're considering the sixth resolution to fund the government just for this year for another several months. Uh, never have any of these either come up or if they did under an open rule where anyone could offer their ideas. Why? Well, everything is being handled by uh, a small uh, group of people, in this case uh, most, mostly Ryan um, and, and uh, Mitchell and, uh, and, and the president. And everybody else is there for the photo op. And uh, you're told that uh, you should go across the street and uh, to either the Republican or the Democratic call rooms and, uh, and raise money because you're going to have an incredibly expensive uh, election coming up uh, in no small measure because of Citizens United and uh, all the money that's going to be pouring in. My district, uh, my election last time was approaching uh, – uh, you know, well over $22 million that have been recorded, but uh, a more in-depth than that, going into the nation, $25 million. So um, the bottom line is members of Congress, uh, for the most part, have become, you know, middle-level level, uh, telemarketers uh, dialing for dollars. And Congress has become an incredibly closed uh, institution, uh, very undemocratic. And the fact is that um, Citizens United has been at the center of what is uh, bringing all of this about. And uh, having served in the 70s when we had regular order, when we didn't have Citizens United, why measures would become before the floor of the House. It was not uncommon, 200 amendments to have every issue fully aired, fully debated argued and voted upon, and that's the way the country operated uh, quite successfully for several hundred years. So uh, let me just uh, uh, conclude by saying the single most important thing that we could do, in my judgment, uh, to get this country back uh, on a much more positive track um, that um, will sustain a, a positive and progressive future is to reverse Citizens United. Because until we do that, we're not going to be able to deal with the wars of choice. We're not going to be able to deal with the disparities uh, in income. We're not going to be able to deal with the public's loss of confidence in our entire system. Uh, you, you name an issue, and you can trace it back to what's happening as a result of this uh, tragic and terrible Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court of the United States. So, Jeff, I want to thank you in particular for the great work that you have done, um, both in your writing and in as CEO of uh, American Promise. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm increasingly uh, of the view that, for the most part, Good things don't really happen uh, in the political arena until the people get fired up and uh, demand it. Uh, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, hopefully, and it does happen from time to time, you have some very enlightened uh, leaders that can uh, move the ball uh, and uh, make positive, progressive change on their own. But generally, it doesn't happen until you have a body politics that is really working, really demanding, insisting that positive changes uh, take place. So uh, I'm really excited about what American Promise is doing and uh, uh, the positive benefits it's going to have for us in the future going forward. So that's kind of my introduction. I'd be glad to take questions and um, uh, hear uh, any other comments that others would, would like to, to make in, uh, on this whole issue. But I thank you for the opportunity to, to have a few words here and to have a chance to meet with all the great leaders and volunteers that are part of American Promise around the country. Well, thank you, Congressman Nolan, and thank you for your kind words. And uh, we certainly are um, so glad to have your leadership and glad you can um, stay for a little bit to uh, address some questions. And I, I just wanted to say we, we look forward to, uh, we hope to see you when uh, all of our citizen leaders from around the country are gathering for our National Citizen Leadership Conference in June. That's June 22nd. And uh, we'll look forward to, to seeing you and, and many other members of Congress up on Capitol Hill on our Citizen Lobby Day on 
on Monday, June 25th, we, we share your view of what um, can help make uh, America move forward, and it's really up to the people, but it certainly requires uh, inspired and, and determined leadership like yours in Congress as well. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it back to Waboy for uh, managing the questions. Thanks. You bet. Thank you, Representative Nolan. And um, yes, now it is time to open it up for some Q&A. So if you do have a question, go ahead and press the number one on your keypad so I know to call on you. And when I do, please let us know where you're calling in from and your question. Um, but before I open it up to everybody, I do have a quick question for you, Representative Nolan. Um, so there's lots of polls that indicate there's a really big cross-partisan support for lessening money's influence in our political system. And for the past year, our APAs have been working to bring Republicans on board. So I have, a, um, I guess, two questions for you. Do you see any shift in your Republican colleagues? And more importantly, what are the effective ways to talk about this issue that really cuts across the aisle? Well, I, I, I think the, uh, the, the, the polling is accurate. Um, people get a, a sense that uh, something is radically wrong in our political system. And, uh, and I think they understand it, it's the excess of influence of, of dark money. And, um, and I find that there are many, uh, uh, I'm not sure many, but there are a lot of Republicans that, that share this view. I've, I've had a wonderfully good working relationship with former Congressman David Jolly, who has uh, been addressing uh, this issue and uh, pointing out that uh, uh, Republicans uh, and Democrats across the country, if they want to enjoy some popular support at election time, they better embrace the need for changing the way that we do our politics in, in this country, uh, starting with Citizens United. I I'd like to make the point that process matters. And uh, by process, I mean the way people get elected and the way uh, a, a, a Congress or a legislative assembly uh, operates. And if the process uh, dictates that dark money uh, is going to have the most influence, uh, then that's problematic. And you have to examine, well, why is that? And the answer, of course, is because of Citizens United. And then um, I hear people saying all the time, why can't the Democrats and the Republicans and the Congress get together and fix some of these things? Well, the answer is the process simply does not allow it. We have not had a vote on whether or not to propose uh, a 28th Amendment to the Constitution to reverse Citizens United. Um, we have not had any votes uh, on many of the great issues of our time. And when we have had some uh, votes, they've come up under what we would call a closed rule, which is more just political partisan uh, positioning. And I think the, the, the powerful interest behind all the money and behind uh, Citizens United, they know full well that there's enough bipartisan agreement out there among Democrats and Republicans to make some of these fundamental changes. But they don't want those fundamental changes uh, to take place. And uh, they use the, the money in politics to um, uh, push this uh, whole closed rule. And, you know, when I say that it's the most closed Congress uh, in the history of, of, of the Congress, um, in the history of the country, that, that's not an opinion. I mean, that's a fact. Um, every, every bill that comes before the uh, floor of the House has to have a rule. And historically, they've been what we call open rules. And um, uh, this Congress, it's been, uh, uh, had more closed rules than any Congress in the history of the country. And even occasionally, uh, they will call, uh, bring stuff up under what we would call a structured rule, where the Rules Committee will uh, allow a handful of amendments to take place. But this is a, this is the most uh, closed uh, Congress in the history of the country, and that's because of the money. And it's unfortunate because we could come together, I think, on a whole wide range of things, on budget, on war, on peace, on campaign reform, on 
immigration reform, on gun safety reform, on, on budgeting, and a whole wide range of issues if the Congress was only allowed to work its will, but it is not. And that's why reversal of the Citizens United is so critically important. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Nolan. Um, and I'm going to open it up to some questions. I see that Marie has her hand up. Marie, you are unmuted. Where are you calling in from and what's your question? Hi, I'm calling in from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I'm a co-leader of Tri-County, New Jersey, APA. And Congressman Nolan, I have um, actually a question to follow up to a boy's question, which is, so do you feel that the, um, the GOP um, Congress people are less apt to co-sponsor some of the really good resolutions like yours that are on the floor, you know, that are, have been submitted to the House because they feel that if they do, they'll um, hurt their money source? Because, as you say, if, if a lot of the Republican Congress people are in support of this, why aren't they co-sponsoring? Um, and then my other question was about our candidate pledge, if you have some suggestions about getting incumbents to sign the candidate pledge, because we've had some pushback about, oh, well, I don't like to sign pledges, just in case when it comes through, if it's not exactly what the pledge says, uh, I don't want anybody to hold me to that. Well, the, yeah, there, there's two good questions there. Um, and one is, um, their GOP members, um, many a number of whom I know who would support a reversal of Citizens United, um, are reluctant to become a, a sponsor for fear of the loss of money at election time. And uh, you know, you can you can talk all you want about you know, money's not important in campaigns and elections, um, but that that just uh, doesn't uh, square with the facts. You you can have the best ideas uh, in the history of humanity, but if they don't get beyond your kitchen table, why uh, th they're not going to go anywhere. And the, you have to have money to get your ideas out there. You have to have money to get your message out there. You have to have money to respond to the uh, distorted, in many cases, untruthful uh, negative images that are being sent out there about you. And so kind of what happens is kind of a cozy relationship where uh, leadership, uh, in this case, I mean, I don't mean this as a partisan matter, but it's just the, the simple truth is, is that uh, Paul Ryan is the uh, leader of the House. He controls the rule committees. Uh, he decides what's going to come up before the floor of the House and when it's going to come up. And so they like to say, you know, look, we'll we'll protect you from having to take votes on, on these critical issues, not just Citizens United, but, uh, you know, everything else. And um, so that when it comes for election time, you, you can – you can claim to be supportive of this, that, and the other, uh, including, uh, you know, changing the way we do politics and taking the dark money out of politics. But if you've never had to vote on it, um, uh, how's the public uh, to know the difference? And, uh, again, the, the fact is, is that if members of the Congress aren't required to vote on and or honor some of the promises that they and pledges they make uh, at election time, then um, the public is no wiser as to who their real friends are and or are not. So uh, that that gets back to Citizens United because the, uh, the, uh, the, the groups that have emerged under Citizens United, like in, in my election case, there's like 15, 16 million dollars uh, in these PAC groups. And uh, I don't have any control over it, but I, I tell you what, there are, do, are some people who do have some control over it, and um, and that's why we have to reverse it since United. I hate to sound like a, a broken record. Now, with regard to pledges, um, there are a number of members who say, uh, I don't make any pledges. Um, but I tell you what, I don't know very many of them that are in that category. Uh, they're very, very selective on uh, what kind of pledges they choose to make and, and not to make. 
and I think it's I think it's imperative to um, um, make them uh, take a stand uh, before election, um, and for people to, to, to let them know in no uncertain terms that um, that whether or not they choose to support a reversal of Citizens United is one of a number of important issues that is going to determine whether or not they're going to get your support. Um, and as I said from the beginning, in my judgment, uh, reversing Citizens United is probably the most important issue that everything uh, goes awry as long as that, uh, that's, that, that Supreme Court decision and all this dark money remains controlling factor in uh, not just our campaigns and elections, but the way we govern our country. Thank you so much. Um, Mary Sue, you are unmuted. Where is your question? Where are you calling in from? I'm calling in from Dayton, Ohio. And um, thank you, Representative Nolan. I really appreciate the fact that you introduced HJR 48 back in 2013. Um, and I also understand that Citizens United is the catchphrase that gets people's attention. But I also think it's important to go back to what um, Move to Amend did when they started, you know, with that language for HJR 48, with the con corporate constitutional rights and overturning that as well. Because Citizens United by itself, back in 2009, things were not great. Citizens United was in 2010. So, you know, you have to go back through, historically, through Supreme Court decisions for over 100 years to see how this actually evolved. And I think it's important also just to recognize that language of we need to overturn corporate constitutional rights. It impacts big ag and the environment. It impacts um, schools, everything that, um, that people care about. So I was wondering if you could address that issue a little bit for people. Thanks. Well, that, you know, your point is well taken. and. Um, uh, many of us are of the view that, uh, myself included, that uh, corporations uh, are not people and uh, should not be uh, characterized uh, in the law in any manner, shape, or form as such. Um, so it, it does go beyond um, the, the role of corporations and money in, in, in politics. Um, you know, having said that, um, I must uh, just a slight word of caution and that is um, reversing Citizens United right now is uh, in the, the messaging um, mode. And um, we have to be careful not to let the fine print, uh, or as is often said, let, let the perfect um, you know, be the uh, enemy of the good. Uh, because at any event, if they would open up this Congress and open up the uh, committee and allow us to consider uh, legislation to uh, amend the Constitution, to reverse Citizens United, uh, I, I can rest assured when you get all the lawyers uh, from all the different philosophies and different uh, places around the country uh, shaping that language, um, no one knows for sure exactly what it might look like, um, only that if it's going to be supported, it has to be effective in uh, taking all the corporate dark money out of politics would be be the first goal and objective from, from my consideration. And then, and then secondly, um, not, not in importance either, but uh, this is one of the two things we have to do is to finally make this uh, point in the law that corporations are not people. So, uh, but I have seen cases where you know we've gotten too carried away during the message phase uh, with getting the perfect language and kind of dividing ourselves and forgetting the message, uh, which is corporations are not people, and we got to take this dark money out of our politics. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bill Davis. You are unmuted. Where are you calling in from, and what's your question? Bill uh, Davis. I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm calling from Dayton, Ohio. Uh, I'm also interested in um, overturning Citizens United, and I wanted to uh, thank Mr. Nolan for 
uh, sponsoring HJ Resolution 48. Um, I, I just uh, was wondering if you can uh, address how, uh, how American Promise is different from Move to Amend, which seems to be an organization that's been around longer and, and has a, a tighter grip on um, you know, the idea that corporations should not have constitutional rights. You've, you've spoken a lot about uh, money um, in politics, but I'm wondering what, uh, what do you see as the differences between American Promise and Move to Amend? Well, maybe I'll jump here on in on that. Yeah. It's Jeff. It's yep. Jeff Clements, and I'm happy to um, address that. Uh, I don't want to take Congressman Nolan's um, time now because I, I don't think it's um, we need to ask him to describe all the different groups. The, the 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 wonderful thing about this work is there are many, many, many good organizations doing this work around the country, and and what we're trying to do, all of us, is unite and be strong and build this movement to win. So I can talk about it more after we let Congressman Nolan go, but I want to make sure other people have a chance to ask Congressman Nolan about uh, his work in Washington if he wants to comment on organizations or anything like that. Of course, he's certainly free to, but I just wanted to say I'll be happy to address that in more detail after. And um, again, if you have questions, you can press 1 on your keyboard, and I'll, I'll just give Congressman Nolan a chance if he wants to say anything on that um, before I do later on, but otherwise back to Waboy. Jeff, I'll let you take that later on. Uh, to be clear, there are a number of very good organizations, and they uh, all have a different, uh, slightly different angle uh, uh, on Citizens United, uh, all of which, in my judgment, are, are value and important. Um, but I do want to take a minute. Nobody's asked this question, but um, uh, I do want to point out that um, if and when and uh, I certainly hope that we do, and I believe we will, reverse Citizens United. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done in uh, restoring democracy in this country. And, and I, I do have a restored democracy bill, which uh, HR 343, which starts with reversing Citizens United. But it also provides, uh, uh, so where do you go from there? It also provides for a system of, of small donations and uh, public financing for campaigns, uh, independent commissions to do away with gerrymandering, uh, obviously full disclosure of where any money comes from, uh, online registration and doing away with a lot of this voter su suppression. Um, I quite frankly would like to see uh, a limitation on when campaign monies can be spent. Most European democracies, um, you know, have uh, elections that go anywhere from 30 to 90 days. Uh, my bill provides for 60. Um, I'm not sure that's the, the sacred number of days either. I just know that they shouldn't be 365 days a year every year. And then lastly, what I've talked about is restoring regular order. So, but the linchpin to all of this, again, is reversing Citizens United. But then uh, the question, uh, obviously, we have to ask ourselves is where do we go from there? And there are a number of things that can and should be done to uh, make our process more inclusive, more open, and more democratic. And uh, those are some of the ideas that I've put on the table. And uh, once we get to Citizens United, uh, by the way, I, I encourage our, our friends to take a look at uh, my Restored Democracy legislation, uh, 343. Thank Next you, question. Representative Nolan. Um, okay, so we have Jill. Jill, you are unmuted. What's your question and where are you calling in from? Hi, I think I have you off the of speaker. Do I sound like I'm on speaker? <laughs> I can hear you, John. You sound good. Rick Nolan. Okay. Um, hi, Rick Nolan. Thanks for all you do. I'm Jill Hinkemeyer, and I'm from Princeton, Minnesota. Uh, thanks for everything you've done for CD8, Nolan. We're going to miss you so much. And my question is a follow-up to the difference between American Promise and Move to Amend, which I am a member of, Lake Area Move to Amend in Brainerd, Minnesota. 
And are you suggesting that uh, we uh, take the easier route uh, that is only attacking Citizens United and, 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 not, and avoiding the larger picture uh, that corporate personhood was inserted unconstitutionally in 1886 during the uh, Santa, Santa Clara County versus South Pacific Railroad. Uh, that's where this all began. No, I'm not suggesting that uh, either one is more important than the other. I uh, Fundamentally, uh, the most important of all is, is from my perspective, is, is that um, uh, uh, corporations are not people, and uh, uh, and I believe they have been uh, well constitutionally. The, the courts have, have have acknowledged that they're people, but I don't believe that's in keeping with our constitution and or our system. Uh, you know, having said that, until we get the money out of politics, uh, we're going to have a, a, a mighty difficult time getting anything done. Uh, so, but they're equally important in my judgment, both reversing Citizens United to get the money out of politics and then uh, the uh, effort to, to uh, re reverse the whole notion that corporations are people. They're both equally important. Excellent. Thank you all so much um, for your questions and thank you, Representative Nolan, for your inspiring leadership on this issue. Um, and now before we get to our grassroots victory, I want to start with some actions that have been taken recently. Um, last year, APA members had 17 meetings with elected officials or their staff. And so far, APA members have already had 13 meetings with elected officials or their staff. And at that rate, we go from 17 meetings last year to 78 this year. And I really think we're going to smash through that. So excellent work. Um, last year, there were 26 media pieces published, and so far this year, there have been 10 media pieces published. And if we keep going at that rate, we go from 26 media pieces last year to 60 this year. And again, another milestone I think we're definitely going to hit. You all are making incredible progress. And we want to make sure that we know about your meetings with elected officials and your media pieces that are published so we can include them in our total for the next month. So if you've had a meeting with an elected official or their staff or a media piece published that we might not know about, please send me an email at wambuig at americanpromise.net. That's w a m B-U-I-D at AmericanPromise.net. The growth that we're seeing in these numbers is super exciting and indicative of the more and more people stepping up and getting involved to get big money out of politics. I'm now going to pass it over to Ishwari, who is an incredible citizen leader from Santa Fe. Hi, Ishwari. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Well, boy, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, I'm really glad to be here. And thank you, uh, Mr. Nolan, for, for all you've done. You're really, I think, one of our heroes. <laughs> um, so, New Mexicans for Money Out of Politics, uh, that's the name of my, our organization here. It's also known as NMMOP. We are a grassroots nonprofit and tax exempt, just recently, uh, organization. We're dedicated to removing the corrupting influence of money in politics, and we're also dedicated to being nonpartisan, which is not easy, but we're very dedicated to that. Uh, ben Gubitz of American Promise, um, who most of you know, came to Santa Fe about a year ago, April 1st, 2017. He did a presentation and a training. We actually had a group of 75 people, so it was very well uh, received. And at, as a result of that, we affiliated uh, the 28th Amendment part of our work uh, with American Promise. So we've been working closely with uh, American Promise since then for about almost a year. We can happily announce right now that Santa Fe just elected a new mayor last Tuesday, and we used ranked choice voting for the very first time. So that was exciting. MOP, our organization, NM MOP, had hosted a mayoral candidate forum before the election, and in the context of that, we had approached all five mayoral candidates with the American Promise Pledge. 
Well, the one candidate who signed the pledge happens to be the one who won, and he'll be our new mayor. So we're very excited. Um, I do need to note that as a 501c3, Mock does not incur, uh, endorse candidates, uh, but it does seem noteworthy that our new mayor did sign the uh, American Promise Pledge. So um, the second thing I want to talk about, we were excited uh, recently in January when we had an opportunity to meet with John Pudner of Take Back Our Republic, which is a relatively conservative organization. And Pudner is actually also on the advisory board for American Promise. Uh, so we met with him. We had a great uh, dinner meeting, enjoyed meeting him. And in addition to beginning to form a relationship, we actually learned a little bit about lobbying from a conservative perspective, which was very interesting. Within days of the time we met with, uh, with Pudner, he actually had found a sponsor in the New Mexico um, legislation, legislators for um, House Joint Memorial 10, which it was the reason he had, had come to Santa Fe. HJM 10 is aimed at passing what's called the Fix-It America Constitutional Amendment. And that was introduced in the New Mexico House um, this past session. Fix-It America is a really brief and concise document, uh, and it involves two things. One, requiring Congress, requiring Congress to regulate the role of money in elections. And two, making gerrymandering illegal. We were super excited about this and to also know that New Mexico um, is one of several states where this Fixed America Amendment was being introduced kind of as a pilot. And uh, so we started organizing right away. You know, New Mexico, we are so fortunate here because contrary to what Mr. Nolan was saying about how closed the U.S. Congress is, our legislation, legislate, uh, legislative body is really open and accessible. We can go to you know, the committee hearings and sit in on the votes, and we have a lot of access to our process here in New Mexico. Um, so several of all our, our volunteers were able to attend the very first committee hearing. A few stood up and spoke in favor of um, the Fix It America Memorial, and it passed in that hearing with bipartisan support. And then, of course, after that, a number of us sent emails and made phone calls to legislators and committee chairs um, asking for the, first of all, for the memorial to be scheduled at each juncture, and then asking the entire legislative um, body to pass it. So it actually was weakened a little bit during the process uh, by several amendments, but in the end it did pass, and again with bipartisan support. So it's now on the record in the state of New Mexico. We felt like it was a really, really wonderful success to have been um, involved in. So I feel very strongly that these resolutions and memorials, they're not one-time deals. They serve to keep these really important issues front and center so that when the time comes that the U.S. Congress actually does pass a 28th Amendment, and I'm, I'm holding out hopes that it will, um, at that time New Mexico will be ready and willing to ratify. So that's really one of the things that motivates us here. Moving forward, now that uh, our legislative session is over, we're going to use the data from that Fix It America um, memorial as we approach our legislators in state to sign the, the uh, American Promise Pledge. Knowing how they voted on that memorial, it's going to be a really good opener as we start conversations about signing the pledge and supporting you know, the whole 28th Amendment notion. So um, that's going to be sort of our strategy and we hope to take advantage of the momentum that Fix It America has created. We see it as a great opportunity to integrate a number of different ways that getting money out of politics is manifesting here in New Mexico. One, the grassroots activity of things like the American Promise Pledge. Two, actual state legislation like HJM10. And three, the collaboration with uh, various organizations. So. That's kind of my, my, little, my little offering here today, and I thank you so much for um, inviting me to, to, to speak. I appreciate the opportunity to share this little success story with everybody on this call. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Um, your group has been in such serious action. 
Um, now we're going to talk about meetings with elected officials in just a second. But if there's anybody on the call who is not yet in an APA and wants to learn more about starting an American Promise Association, feel free to send me an email at wambuig at americanpromise.net. I'm now going to turn it over to Azer Cole, who is going to lead a role play before going over this month's action. Hey, Azer. Hey, Waboy, and thanks so much, Ashwari. It's fantastic hearing from you and everyone else on this call. Um, we're now going to just practice asking our elected officials or candidates a series of questions that will allow them to go deeper on what they believe and why they believe it. You know, this is especially good for first time meetings or meetings with Republicans who might be uncomfortable co sponsoring bills with one or maybe zero fellow Republican co sponsors. Because if we can truly listen to our elected officials, we're more likely to see an opening for action and for next steps. So I'm going to ask Waboy to play the role of an elected official. I hope that's all right, Waboy. And I'm going to ask questions to honestly get to know what you, as an elected official or candidate, think and to find a way to go deeper with you on this ever important issue. So, well, boy, which elected official are you going to pretend to be in this role play? I will be a Congresswoman uh, from Boston. All right. Well, thank you so much, Congresswoman Gatheru, for meeting with us here today. And just a little quick side note, you know, first, me and my group members would introduce ourselves. We'd share why getting money out of politics is important to us thank our Congresswoman for something she's done. And then one of us might ask this type of question. And Congresswoman, I first really just want to ask you simply, what do you think about money in politics? Um, is this something that you feel affects your day-to-day -day work? Um, yes, unfortunately, money in politics is something that absolutely affects my work um, and more than I would like it to. And could you just say a little bit more about specifically um, how it affects your work, Congresswoman? Yeah, so I spend a lot of time fundraising, certainly more time than I'd like to, and that takes away time from me meeting with constituents like yourself. And what's it like fundraising all the time? Is this a rewarding part of your job? Yeah, so fundraising is extremely time consuming and not something I would call rewarding or something that I particularly enjoy. Um, what I actually enjoy is meeting with my constituents and learning about their lives and how to best advocate for them in Congress. And fundraising takes time away from me meeting with my constituents and learning more about legislation. And Congresswoman, I don't think you're alone in that. Um, have you given any thought to what can be done about this problem? so that you could spend the bulk of your time working with your constituents and not worrying about fundraising? You know, Azer, I actually haven't been able to give much thought to this. I'm super busy with my committee obligations, and of course, I focus on my constituents' needs, but I'm not really sure what I can individually do. And Congresswoman, can I just tell you about the solution that me and my group are focused on? Of course, I would love to hear it. All right, great. So I'm going to hop out of this role play. You were fantastic, Congresswoman Gatheru. And Thank what you. we've done really is establish that there is a serious problem in your own words. In this case, Congresswoman Gatheru you know, doesn't really know what she can do about the problem. And that might not always be the case, but you can see the type of questions we're asking to try to learn exactly where our elected officials or candidates stand on this issue what they already know, what they don't know, so that we can most effectively describe what we're advocating for. And I want to remind people that this is primarily for first-time meetings with elected officials or for Republicans who might feel uncomfortable co-sponsoring bills with only Democrats. And with one elected official, you might get an overwhelmingly positive answer. They've already co-sponsored all the bills that they can. They've taken the candidate pledge. And then they're not done, but you ask them to do even more something like work across the aisle to bring a colleague on board or write an op-ed about the importance of the 28th Amendment that we would help them place. So I know this is something people are already doing, and it's something some people are doing for the first time. So I'm curious if anyone on the call has a question about this type of role play, about asking these types of questions. And if you do, just go ahead and press 2 on your keypad 
and I'll know to call on you. So again, if you've been having meetings with your elected officials or candidates and you know have been asking these type of questions or maybe just are, are curious about this process, go ahead and press two on your keypad and I'll know to call on you. All right, it looks like we've got uh, we've got some shy folks on the call. I guess everyone has been doing this and with great success. Well, boy, I know one of the questions that sometimes comes up is, you know, how do we best um, contextualize the problem of money in politics um, within the answers our elected officials give us? You know, it's important to be able to have sort of a broad understanding of the issue, you know, and that comes from doing things like listening to these calls with the, you know, a variety of guest speakers who are approaching this issue from a number of angles. So there's more, you know, of an opportunity and a percent, a higher percentage that will have some insight on the 28th amendment that is going to directly relate um, to whatever our member of Congress has said. Um, you know, it's also, you probably noticed in the type of questions I was asking you, well, boy, you know, none of them are yes or no questions. They're all open-ended, um, really trying to give our elected official or candidate an opportunity to explain the problem in their own words. And maybe in the process of answering those type of open-ended questions, um, you know, figuring out for themselves exactly where they stand on this issue. Um, so I'm just looking at the clock, and in the sake of time, I'm going to tie this into our action for this month, which is directly related. It's writing a letter to our member of Congress urging them to sign the candidate pledge because elected officials don't create political will. They respond to it. And it's up to us to encourage ours to sign the candidate pledge to stand with people and not profits. Now, if you're working in a group of people already, and I hope most people are, it's likely, likely that there's already a liaison for your members of Congress. Um, each member of the group can certainly write a letter about the candidate pledge. This is fantastic. But the liaison is really encouraged to go one step further and actually request a meeting. And when you meet, as I mentioned before, if your member of Congress is supportive and signs the pledge, you can go a step further and ask them about an op-ed urging other members of Congress in their state to sign the, ple to sign the pledge or to take some other next step action. And if they're not yet supportive, ask them questions like the one we just practiced to understand their position and to begin an ultimately productive relationship. And this action is part of the broader candidate pledge campaign, a campaign aimed at presenting the pledge to every elected official running for office in 2018, both incumbents and challengers, so that voters know exactly where they stand on fixing the ever-growing problem of money corrupting our political system. And if you don't have the action sheet right in front of you, but are at a computer, you can actually go to AmericanPromise.net and on the Take Action bar at the top of the page, you can click the How We Win Together button, then the Get Involved in Your Community button. And if you scroll down to the bottom of that page, you'll see the link to access past action sheets, including this month. Um, this action sheet was emailed to folks that registered for the call um, on Friday, so you likely have it in your inbox, and it'll also be sent out to folks again on Monday. But with that, well, boy, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Azer. Um, Jeff, I would love for you to uh, go ahead and kind of finish that thought before we wrap up this call. Uh, th thanks, well, boy. So um, yeah, do you, uh, you mean the thought about coming back around to how American Promise works, I assume, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, and thanks to everybody on this call. Um, a in a lot of ways, it illustrates what we're we're trying to do. We're delighted to have um, you know people who are trying to get this uh, big, big work, absolutely urgent work, as Congressman Nolan said, to get the Constitution amended so that the con the, the the Constitution and and our system of government is supportive of democracy and and the rights of the people. Uh, rather than turning into uh, what is not an exaggeration to say, a, a concentrated kind of oligarchy where only those with, with powerful uh, forces such as concentrated money or 
control of big corporations controls our system. So we've, you know, we heard, I think just to illustrate, you know, we heard folks in Dayton, Ohio working with Move to Amend. We heard uh, Ishwari and the great work that money out of politics in New Mexico um, is doing there. Um, the, what American Promise and we are trying to do is support efforts, uh, unite us together, connect us together, strengthen our work, no matter what organization you find is most appropriate for you and, and what you you believe, because we are all seeking the same goal. And we may have different tactics, we may have different strategies, we may even have different views, and we um, I, I'm sure we do have different views. And that's the beauty of it, is that we're trying to unite and we're succeeding in uniting the vast, vast majority of Americans who know we have to get this done. And so uh, the kind of work that you're doing, the pledge campaign, the, the meetings with members of Congress, um, I hope you'll uh, check out our Citizen Leaders, uh, National Citizen Leadership Conference at citizenleaders.us, at citizenleaders.us, all one word, and, and uh, register for the conference in June. Another aspect of what American Promise does is bring us together so we can um, see each other, learn from each other, and then we'll be going up to uh, Capitol Hill to let our members of Congress hear from us on Monday, June 25th as well. And so those are all the kinds of things that American Promise is trying to bring to this uh, work and bring many more Americans into this work, and we're delighted with the response. And it's not because of us at American Promise. Well, boy, Azer, thank you. You guys are amazing. Uh, but in the end, as Congressman Nolan said, it's up to Americans across the country. That'll be the test of whether we get this done or not. It's all of us on this phone, all of us beyond this phone who are um, doing things that aren't easy, stepping up to be to our citizen responsibilities and helping to drive this over the finish line. So thanks to everybody. Uh, we're delighted uh, that this movement is growing so much. Uh, we'll continue to do that, and we'll see you at the National Citizen Leadership Conference in June, but I'm sure we'll be seeing you and working together a lot before that. Um, we are bringing the Writing the 28th Amendment project, by the way. I will mention one other thing since Boboy has uh, kindly given me the floor. Um, the Writing the 28th Amendment project is uh, doing the work um, that Congressman Nolan referred to, which is there will be a time, and it will be soon, we hope, um, the 2018 election is important. That's why the pledge is so important. Um, the 2020 election is important, and we'll be building out the pledge to then. But we're driving towards a vote in Congress on this amendment, and that's when there's going to be a real um, you know, wrestling over what the language says. We have to be as strong as we can be, our movement, and we have to have vetted all the different amendment language. As Shwari mentioned, the um, gerrymandering being added to the uh, money in politics in the New, New Mexico resolution, that's a wonderful thing because gerrymandering is a big, big problem. So this amendment is driving a lot of the different solutions we need and um, the writing the 28th Amendment project will help bring many more Americans into the conversation about what should it say, what should it address, how do we make sure we're as strong as possible uh, when our moment comes as it will, uh, if we keep doing this work, when we're pushing the amendment out of Congress and back to the states for ratification. So we'll be in, uh, launching in Boston. If you're in the Boston area, come on out March 27th. If you're near St. Louis and our uh, wonderful new St. Louis, and not so new, they've been very busy actually in St. Louis, our American Promise Association. Look forward to seeing you on April 10th at Washington University, Columbus, Ohio, April 12th, and uh, many more to follow all around the country. We're bringing this amendment on the road. So I look forward to seeing you, and I'll turn it back to Waboy for the signing off. And uh, again, Waboy's um, left her email. You can always contact me at jeffc at americanpromise.net, and I'll look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and like we've been saying, our National Citizen Leadership Conference is going to be in Washington, D.C. from June 22nd to the 25th. And something really exciting about this year is the lobby day that we're going to have where we'll go to Capitol Hill to build support for the constitutional amendment to put the people back in charge. And we'll be hosting a series of calls leading up to the conference each month to educate and empower you on how to best lobby our elected officials. 
So our first call focusing on Lobby Day will be March 28th at 8 p.m. Eastern, and we're going to have an exciting guest speaker, Frances Morlepe, who is an author and researcher, and she's going to talk about her recent book, Daring Democracy, and give her expert guidance on lobbying. So please be on the lookout for, those, uh, for the information on those exciting calls. All right, so it's just about 2 p.m. right here on the East Coast, and we won't keep you over time, so you can get into action right away. Um, because remember, action is the anecdote to cynicism. As always, it's been an honor to be here with you all, and I look forward to talking with you on our next call, which is going to be April 14th. Have an excellent weekend, everybody, and we'll talk soon. Thank you.